Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with the city of Weyburn, Saskatchewan, Councillor Jeff Richards. As one of the fastest growing cities in Saskatchewan, Weyburn is recognized as one of the more desirable places to live and work. Weyburn is a dynamic community with a long history of dedication to providing an exceptional quality of life for residents. Weyburn, Saskatchewan is dedicated to maximizing the opportunities that exist for existing and prospective businesses as well. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Jeff Richards. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know a little bit about the man behind the persona of a councillor, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jeff? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. And I love that you ask it that mm -hmm. way, because you're not asking, you know, what drives you to be a councillor? Uh, specifically, you're saying, what drives you to serve your friends and neighbours, which I think that is a better question, frankly. So I guess growing up, you know, I grew up in rural Saskatchewan where, uh, you know, your dad was a member of the Elks Club and your mom worked at the, you know, the United Church Women's League. And, you know, you cut the neighbor's yard for him when he got too old to cut his grass. And and the church down the road, you trimmed their caragana bushes because because if you didn't, your dad would make sure you regretted your decision one way or the other. So I suppose there's that. And also just that always looking, you know, to make your community better, bigger and stronger. Right. So all my life served, uh, you know, spent most of my life in the business world. Um, so you serve your community. Right. Uh, you know, been the, been the president or the chair uh, of the United Way here. Right. Uh, served on a number of, you know, boards like uh, chambers of commerce and economic developments and you know, minor football and all those things. So that sense to serve, I think, is 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 two things. Number one, it's, it's what you say, Chris. It's a sense to serve. It's also a little bit self-serving for all of us. We want our community to be here for our kids. We want our kids to stay here if we can get them to stay here. We want our communities to grow. And our, our buddy that runs the tire shop down the road, I want him to do good too. So I think it's, it's probably never as altruistic as we sometimes make those answers out to be. Um, but it's a little bit altruistic. We just want to have great towns and stay. What was it about the municipal arena, though, that you yeah. decided that Jeff's duty to serve would be best served there? Because you could have continued on through uh, business, through nonprofits, through giving back, through volunteerism. But and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jeff, in 2016, you decide that your service is going to be upended and is going to be now in the form of sitting around a council table when you're first elected. What was that decision to get involved municipally based on? Yeah, that's great. And so one of one of the one of the things that happened, there was a few of us um, who had been, you know, uh, long timers here and in, in the business community and the nonprofit world. You're right in our community that said, like, you know what, our city's doing a pretty good job and it's a pretty good place to be. But there's a couple of spots where perhaps things have gotten complacent, <clears throat> you know, and some folks have have maybe just forgotten how important little decisions are. So um uh, a, a number of folks in the community and you know not and this isn't to to say that i it is what it is folks in the community said dude you you got the knack for this 
you got to be doing this. We want you to do this. And I went, well, I get what you're saying, but holy smokes, uh, you know, so it's a time commitment for sure. But I think I, you know, then you start going, no, I think I would like this. In fact, yeah, I'm going to do this. So it, it came about that way. Just, I felt like I had something to offer. And I, I like to think the people here, my friends and neighbors think I have that because they voted for me twice now. So, um, you know, and hopefully a third time. So I think that that's what it, it was just a desire to make a few changes. And also, Chris, I would say this bluntly, I think that leadership is important. And I've taken a fair amount of training that way, governance and leadership training. And I think administrative staff need leadership. They don't need direction. Yes, they need direction. Let me rephrase that. But they also need leadership. They need to know this is your lane and we'll allow you to make your decisions inside of this lane. Outside that lane, we're going to step in and say, not so sure you should be there. Maybe you should be there, but you've got to come to us for that. But, uh, but inside of this lane, this is where you're able to operate and they need that leadership. And they need to, I would also say this sincerely, they need to know that it's okay to make mistakes. If you're trying to do great things for our friends and neighbors, our family, and you make a mistake, acknowledge it, say, you know what, that didn't work. We got to go back to the drawing board. They need to have that support from the elected officials. Okay, so there's a few things that I want to unpack there for a few minutes, Jeff. <laughs> sure. First off, did you just say that you're running for a third term? So in October, we're going to see, or sorry, in November, because I always yeah. forget the Saskatchewan's in, a month after the provincial yeah. election, we yeah. will see Jeff Richards' name on the ballot again? You 100% will see my name on a ballot again. Okay, second question. Now, yeah. you were coming to the end of your second full term as a counselor. Uh, you you know now after almost eight years in the office, you're not pleasing 100% of the people with the decisions you're making, <laughs> no matter where you are. How yeah. do you lead a community when you know that you're not going to get 100% of the support on the decisions you're making? Yeah, I, 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 I will tell you this. This is how I do it in my brain. This was taught to me by a mentor years ago. It's the three most important words. And here's why. So sometimes we have to make a decision that benefit. Well, almost, Chris, you're right. Almost every decision will have uh, a good and a bad for some folks, right? That's that's inevitable. I pave in your street, so that means the other guy's street didn't get paved. That's going to happen. But the most important thing is to follow up with folks to say, yeah, we made this decision and here's why. Because, and explain it out, there's no secrets. Lift the veil. Like, there's no secrets here. We have got this much money to spend or this many man hours or whatever the case is. And that's what we're going to do. And I would say this in all sincerity that 99% of the people, when you say to them, and here's why I go, oh, no, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for thanks for clearing that up for me. Most folks are quite reasonable. Yeah. Okay. I, I love this conversation already because we're only about 11 minutes in and we're gone through like 12 different hoops and I've been enjoying it. Good. That That's understandable. But, okay, so I was in Weyburn last summer for when I was doing a big tour across Canada and I stopped right. through. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning and I stopped at a right. Tim Hortons. And A, one of the probably nicest places that I went through when I was in Saskatchewan that was yeah. just at 7 o'clock in the morning. I didn't expect that many yeah. friendly faces because it's yeah. 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> I asked a few people, like, yeah. what's going on in the city? There's, a, there's an apathy I found in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, though, that, you know what? As long as my water's turned on and my garbage was picked up, they really didn't understand. And I, I, I don't want to paint a broad stroke, and I kind of feel yeah. like I'm doing that a little bit here. But there was an apathy. Do you find that there is an apathy when it comes to the decisions that are being made at City Hall? Like when you go out and ask people for their opinions on the decisions that you need to make as a counselor, are you getting the responses that you're looking for as an individual counselor? Or do you feel like you have to pry to get sort of the answers that you're looking for when it comes to the decisions that you need to make at city council? Well, I would say, I would say both those things. So, uh, and I would, I would, uh, you know, you use the term apathy. I would also think that there's a, there's a, there's a degree of contentment that happens as well. So, let me, let, I'll give a couple of, last fall, 
uh, we did a pre-budget um, survey uh, and we also held a couple of events, pre-budget consultations with the community. So yes, absolutely with you know special interest groups, Chamber of Commerce and those kind of places or the arts groups, but also just open house. Come on up and tell us what you think. Here's the proposed budget, uh, knowing that we are gonna have to make some cuts. But what we kind of said was to administration, Put some, put some of your Christmas wish list in there too, because some folks might blow us away and we don't know. <clears throat> so in that situation, we didn't have to pry um, feedback out of folks, to be quite honest. Uh, they were good. Uh, people came up, they asked hard questions. There was, there was some questions, I gotta be honest with you. I said, I don't know. I've got to go back and get administration to answer that because I, I couldn't tell you you know, how much the insurance is on the museum. I have actually no idea and, and good, I should know. Uh, but, but you're right with some things is contentment because sometimes we have put out, you know, um, a decision to say, you know, that we're going to, you know, extend the, the paved trails. That's a good example, the walking, biking trails. And, uh, you know, sometimes you think, oh, I wonder how that's going to, people should be excited about this. Or, or maybe somebody might say, don't be wasting money on that stuff when, you know, the intersection at third and government needs to be re repaved or, or whatever. And so in that way, I would say we don't necessarily get the feedback sometimes that we expect, but I think that is also because a lot of folks are, are feeling pretty good about the seven individuals they have sitting around that table and that they're largely making the same decision they would uh, let me get my we's and they's, that we're largely making the same decisions they would make if they were sitting there. Uh, they would understand, like, look, we have to do this too. Um, and next year we're going to do that, right? So going back to the original statement that you made about why you got involved in 2016, mm -hmm. about those what those little decisions were being made at council. Now, the little decisions for you are going to be completely different than the little decisions that someone else has uh, across yeah. the, the community. How do you balance those? The, and I don't want to say little decisions because yeah. truly the, those decisions, those issues that those individual people have are the most important decisions that they are addressed with that day. That pothole might seem insignificant to someone in the North End, but in the South End, that pothole to them is the biggest issue. How do you balance those small individual issues with the need of the growth and the uh, the, the size of Weyburn? Because you only have a limited supply of money every year that you can't solve every little decision at the end of the day. Say, and you, you go back to say, and here's why. But sometimes, and here's why, isn't the answer that they're looking for is, I want it fixed today. Yeah, you're right. And so that's, and you know this, I'll, I'll give you the answer that you know, and then I'll give you a better one that that <laughs> welcome to, well, welcome to every single day in a municipal councillor's life, right? That is a hundred percent what we spend our time going. Um, but there are, for the most part, I find that if, if it is, if it is making somebody, um, you know, causing them to stress inside they're they've lost sleep about it you're you're here's a great example you know we've got a a bit of a, a problem at one intersection kind of off the side of the intersection where the ground has just let go over the last couple of years these freeze thaw cycles with these goofy winters we've had and it is it is not a big deal but it's a big enough deal that some folks are losing sleep over it and 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 here's the deal we got to deal with this now because if if someone you know, so if, if, a, if a truly, you know, rationally thinking person is is coming to you three and four times going, yeah, dude, I heard you and here's why. That's not good enough. This has got to get fixed. If they're coming to you like that, the, the reality is it, we probably need to get over there and have a look at what we better fix this. So that's really how I balance it, right? Is, you know, it's it's always the needs of the many or the needs of the one and all those kind of little catchphrases. But sometimes you've got to go and deal with the thing. You know, I can remember one time, um, you know, somebody had a, a tree um, that was just dying in their front yard and the city is is responsible for those trees in the front rows. Right? And, you know, the tree wasn't at that point where uh, it needed to come down uh, in the eyes of the, the tree experts. Uh, but in the eyes of the homeowner, this thing needed to go. And this and this guy was a great guy and he wasn't belligerent about it, but he just kept saying, look, at this is not we went over there. A couple of us just got in a truck and drove over and said, look, we need to really talk to uh, you know, public works and probably have a, a conversation about this tree because it's not good. And you sometimes you just got to fix those one-offs. And maybe that's the beauty sometimes of the smaller cities 
you know, in, in Edmonton, that might be harder to do, right? In Weyburn, you know, I know Frank and I know he's not going to steer me wrong. So if I go over there, he's going to come out in the yard. He's going to say, look, guys, what do we do here? How do I address this thing? So normally you can fix the problems. I think that's not just a small town, a small city thing in Saskatchewan. I think that's just a Saskatchewan thing. When I speak to municipal leaders across Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. I get a sense that even in Saskatoon and Regina, everyone knows everyone. Yes, there might be new people who come to the community, but when I was in Weyburn, like when people saw that I, I had an Alberta license plate stopping in the downtown core, I had two people stop and go, oh, where are you coming from? And I went, okay. People yeah. have, there's a sense that like people are very close knit in the community. I want to challenge you a little bit for a second. A, I'm not really challenged, but the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few is not a saying. It is a great quote that needs to be addressed every single time from yes. my favorite Vulcan, Spock. That's my yes. Right. <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> no, but you're right. It is true. The needs of the many always do, but there are just times when you have to one off something, right? Yeah. And you got to drive over to the guy's house and it is what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, and I and I agree with that statement. Um before we turn to the city as a whole and Weyburn yeah. for a second, I want to ask one last question because I'm trying to figure out in this country if municipal, while you and I probably will agree that municipal politics and municipal governance is the closest to the people, you are the ones who deal with a lot of the issues. You also deal with a lot of people who don't understand the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays compared to the other levels of government. When when I was in Weyburn, I had people talking to me about healthcare, about education. Now, you and I both know that that's not in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality. How do you, as a councillor, address those issues that people are bringing to you, whether they be education, healthcare, housing, or even something that's in the federal mandate, without telling people it's not my issue? Because to them... They don't care. And I shouldn't say they don't care. You are the closest to them. They probably know you better than they know their MLA or their MP. So they want you to fix the issue that they're coming to. How do you balance your role in a jurisdictional manner, knowing that your role is very limited in scope? Yeah, that's uh, that's a big part of what we have to learn to do better, uh, myself included. But I, I don't I don't really love the, uh, Oh, that's not my problem. I don't, that's, that's not my problem. I don't, I don't think that's a good answer. And I'll be honest with you. If my MLA gave me that answer about a federal uh, thing, I would, I would also not accept that answer. So here's how I personally deal with it. First off, I suppose I would say this, I would try to understand the problem. I'll, I'm going to, if I, I'm going to talk a lot on this one, because this is an important one, particularly Saskatchewan right now, you know, where we seem uh, almost at odds with our federal government. And um, I would say this. First off, let's talk about healthcare. So doctors are problematic in, in Saskatchewan. Under doctors aren't problematic. Let me rephrase that. The lack of doctors in Saskatchewan has become problematic at times over the last 20 years. Especially so, in rural communities like 100%. Weber. Yep, you bet. Exactly right. So uh, first off, it would be easy for the civic government to go... Uh, health is a provincial issue or a federal issue, to a degree. We're not, that's not our problem. Sure. But that's not good enough because there are things we can do, right? We can, you know, I've sat for a couple of years on what we call the doctor retention committee. Um, I would literally uh, drive to Regina and pick doctors up off the airplane, bring them back to Weyburn and, and take them to their new home. And uh, if one time even had to explain, you know, this is a snow shovel and here's what we're going to do with it. Uh, because this gentleman had come from Egypt and had not seen this before. So this was something, right? So we have to do these things. And so we can do those things. We can do some things. The second part of it, though, Chris, is the most important part. My job as an elected councillor is to address the issues of my friends and neighbours that live here. And if if my neighbour says, man, I, I don't know what to do about housing, that's not a civic issue, but if it's the M if it's a provincial government issue, I darn sure better have the MLA on speed dial, and he darn sure better be listening to me when I call him. That's how the relationship works, right? Is we have to be comfortable um, having those, whether we like the 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 government of the day or not, is irrelevant. 
your MLA is you, and and I've and I and I'll stand on this soapbox. Your MLA does not have his or her seat at the ledge. They have your seat at the ledge. So they are there to work for you. I'm there at city council to work for you. So if you are coming to me saying I've got a problem and it's a provincial issue, I will if if I think there's value and if I think that I can make uh, something happen, I will drive to Regina or our MLA lives here in Weymouth. So we're lucky his office is here. Um, so I'll I'll set him. I probably have coffee with our MLA in his office. I'm going to say 10 times or more a year just to say those kind of things. Um, things like municipal highway interconnector programs, right? Where a highway comes through our city and it becomes a city street for a couple of blocks and it's a highway again. And saying, buddy, we got to do better. That that street is, we have one right now that is just getting approved for, so it's a great, it's an easy example for me, but it's 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 me pounding the desk saying, we got to do better here. And what do we do? So I hope that answers your question. I talked a lot, but it does, but it brings up an important question because, and I'm not picking on Saskatchewan here. It's just, we're using yeah. this ref, using this as a case study for a second. Yeah. When I speak to municipal leaders across Canada, I often hear the analogy that it's easier for a councillor, a mayor to get a call back from their local MLA or MP because there's that title. There's that title of, I'm a counselor, I can reach out to my MLA, and there's probably more likely that they will respond to me directly than a, a resident. Now, I'm not saying in Weyburn that's the case, but do you find people are coming to you because, A, they know you know the MLA probably a little bit better than they might know, or even the MP, so your call brings a little bit more significance to their issue than, say, if average John on the street is calling up their MLA saying, okay, I have an issue and I want to deal with it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Unequivocally. Yes. <laughs> Second part of that though, is you have to respect that relationship. So your MLA, your MP, they are busy people and they got a ton of things going on. So if I'm going to them every week going, Oh man, I wish that, you know, uh, the roadsides on the edge of town were nicer. And those that, no, you, you have to respect that time and respect what they can do. And, to answer your first question, I, I think and I hope people, I know people have that confidence that I'll take their issue forward where I can, and I hope they continue to have that confidence. Yeah. No, yeah. I appreciate that. So yeah. I want to turn to the city as a way, the Weyburn as a whole now. Yeah. But before I ask this question, as I always do, I want to preface this line of questioning with this. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send emails, please send them to me and I will file them in the appropriate location. This is his conversation and not the council as a whole. This may okay. match up to what the city is talking about, but it's his opinion. Councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Weyburn today? Yeah, two things, but primarily it is infrastructure. Um, and by infrastructure, I mean, you know, from the street down. <clears throat> and I really think we have got an infrastructure deficit. And, and, you know, I would say talking to my peers, Weyburn doesn't have the patent on an infrastructure deficit. You know, that is something that a lot of communities are facing. You know, Saskatchewan is 120 years old kind of thing, right? And, and the life expectancy, a lot of that stuff that was put in in the 50s is coming to an end. And that's problematic, you know. Uh, we've done a really good job, but we hear, I hear all the time, uh, probably the, 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 you know, one of the biggest complaints I hear from our citizens is the condition of our streets. Um, and I get that. And, and, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to give too many excuses, but, you know, we do live in a, a, the last couple of winters have been bonkers with the uh, freeze thaw cycles and that causes problems. And we've been doing some cold, uh, what do they call it? Cold patching, you know, just to get us through the winter. Uh, but we need to work on that. And we've done that. A few years back, we invested uh, quite a lot of money, 16, 17, 15, even to a degree, in our water treatment plant. So our water treatment plant will get us to 15,000 people. We're currently 11,000 people, right? So we've put that in place. Um, we have, I believe, removed all of our lead lines now for water supply. So that kind of stuff is done. But, you know, it one of the one of the proclivities of, of politicians is... To th is to tell you all the good they've done and then do this or also to a proclivity to not put taxes up 
And and that's a that's a terrible thing to do to people because prices go up, uh, labor goes up, so gas prices go up, truck prices go up, everything goes up. So when you when you put a zero percent increase on you, good, good. And we and we upgraded the water treatment plant in 2015. So all of the we fixed the infrastructure. Nope, you never infrastructure is never done, right? Infrastructure is like your teeth. You got to keep that stuff. You don't go get them cleaned and then you're done. You got to keep it up, and you're always reinvesting. And you have to keep you have to keep your budget in a great spot so that you never have to go to somebody and say, "Look, your tax bill is going to go up." 28 bucks a month next year because here's why that is not something i'm comfortable doing i would sooner go to folks and say look at you can probably expect for the next three or four years a two or three or four dollar a month increase on your property taxes and here's what we're going to do with that money and here's why we're doing what we're going to do with that money so infrastructure number one number two we have got uh some relationships that we need to work on and, and I don't mean that to be negative, um, but we need to have super lines of communication all around us. A few years back, my one of my first, uh, so but prior to joining city council, I served as the chair of what's called our regional, uh, district regional planning commission. So it's basically the city of Weyburn and the RM of Weyburn, which is the city of Weyburn, it's kind of in the middle of the RM of Weyburn. Um, and so one of the things that we did there was we, we created a district planning commission. So the two municipalities were working together. That is critical. Uh, we're not islands out here, right? Uh, we're one of one of at the time we were one of very few in the province. Boom, we got to get that. Now we got to keep that up when it comes to economic development. We got to keep that up when it comes to population growth. It is not us versus them. If somebody, if the John Deere dealer, which then this happened, the John Deere dealer, the Case I H dealer, the New Holland dealer, over the last few years, they moved out of Weyburn and they got R R M land and they built big dealerships out there. That's okay. That is okay. We couldn't offer them the size they needed in Weyburn in the time frame they wanted. I'm not saying we couldn't have got there. We surely could have got there. But I don't want to ever be in the way of a business decision. Move out there. Most of their folks live here. They buy their groceries here. They do these things here. It is okay. The relationship though with the RM is critical to understand the impact that has on infrastructure. Second, you know, relationships with our folks internally. So uh, one of the first things I did uh, when I got on council is uh, we started a youth council, one of very few in the province, if not the only one that we have in the province. We bring these these young people in in groups every year, uh, up to five. Um, this is an important relationship. They've taught me more than, and I, I would say this tongue in cheek, than sometimes I learned going to SUMA for four days. These young people have lots to teach us. So I value that. So those kind of relationships. And you and I just talked a few minutes ago about the relationships with our, our next levels of government. Even the feds, even the feds. We have a member of parliament here, right? And no, our member of parliament's not currently in government. He's on the other side of the house, but he can still bring information back and forth. And that's critical. So, and I, and, and I, and I mean that, you know, we have to have those relationships. I mean that in the sincerest way. If those relationships aren't working, we've got problems. We'll have problems. Okay, so there's two sandboxes that I want to play in here. I want to mm -hmm. start with the infrastructure one because that's the first thing you mentioned. And it's a critical issue that not only is addressing what you are dealing with in Weyburn, but across Canada. The issues of today are going to be exacerbated by the economic challenges that we face today as well. When you first got elected in 2016, the cost of doing business was a lot lower, probably not a lot lower, but significantly lower than what it is today. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any cheaper. It seems like though those those infrastructure projects, whether they be underground, whether they be asphalt, whatever you want to call it, are getting significantly more. Now, I agree. Keeping tax rates low are important. Keeping tax rate flow over an extended period of time is, is important. But you just mentioned that you are in an infrastructure deficit. Things are coming, they are aging out of uh, working condition today. How do you see a path forward understanding that you can't fix everything unless you do have to do it on the backs of the people, but the people are struggling. The people right here, right now, are challenging. While that $3 a month might not seem significant at the end of the day, $3 is a lot to a lot of people who are going paycheck to paycheck. How do you see yourself as a council and a counselor doing that? 
Well, first off, I think you just quoted one of my uh, one of my soapboxes at City Council about six or eight months ago. Because uh, oftentimes it's easy it's easy to go ah it's three or four bucks it doesn't matter it's three or four bucks but it's just that three or four bucks but then your utilities are going to go up three or four bucks your power bill is going to go up three or four bucks and and your car insurance is going to go up and all of a sudden it's eighteen bucks and somebody can't a senior citizen can't stay in her house anymore maybe right so you're you're right because I think one of the tools that municipalities have um, that maybe bigger governments don't have is and we have to do better at it. Wayburn's not great at it either. No community is great at it, but we do a pretty good job. But we have to talk about it is that what I call uh, the team Wayburn approach. So when we have a problem, it might be that we don't say to all the departments, look, we need you to stay under a 4% increase this year. Because that's kind of the way things happen, right? Maybe what we need to say is, you know what, police, you're, we need you to probably be at 8 or 10% this year because we need a new police station. That's a bad example, but that's something we'll be talking about in the future, right? And, and I guess that means department over here, you're probably at 1% or 2% this year. So we have to take it from that team waiver and perspective where, where it's not, uh, well, those guys got 3%, so I get 3%. Nope, not every year is it going to be like that. You might get 9% this year, but only 2% next year. That's just how, so we have to shift. We have to be okay with that. And that, and that's sometimes hard because what that might mean, Chris, is that next year, your department might have to take a cut a little bit. You might get less than you got last year. And as long as we, as a council, and more so, I would say, as administration, city manager and his leadership team are able to surf that wave, we will be okay to get to where we need to go without putting percent cost increases on the second part of that, I'll go back to it, is it is those relationships, right? If if we need a director of planning and development, and that is a one hundred thousand dollar a year position, regardless of what it is, and the city down the road, Estevan, needs a director of planning and development, do we both need a full time hundred thousand dollar a year director of planning and development? I don't know that. This may be a terrible example for me to make. But we can have these conversations. If the RM of Estevan is going to buy two new graders, can the city of Weyburn say, well, we need two new graders too. We can probably negotiate a better price on our graders if we're buying four graders versus two graders, maybe. Chris, I'm making examples. No, no, I and I no, and I, can, I agree wholeheartedly on that because um and I forget the name of the RM that surrounded it, but Mike Strachan, the mayor of Torquay, said that exact same thing to me at SUMA last year was his smaller community would not be able to afford a big giant grader. So working with those surrounding communities, that surrounding rural municipality, it's easier to offset some of those costs when you know that a grader is now Four hundred thousand dollars, hypothetically saying, and if Wayburn and Way the RM of Wayburn can both pitch in three hundred thousand and get two for the price of almost one, why not do that? I agree right. with that, <laughs> but we live in the reality of twenty twenty four, there, Councillor, yeah. where yeah. partisanship, the isolation of me first and everyone else next, is prominent. How do you see yourself building those relationships? If you are so successful in being reelected in twenty uh, in November of this year, yeah, I, th I put a great emphasis on it, Chris. I did before I got on council. You know, it was uh, it was the, the the reeve of the RM at the time, the mayor of the city at the time, and myself in a room saying we we got to do better. There, no good comes of opposition with your neighbor like this, and and I'm not saying that I alone had. I'm not the guy. But sometimes that outside that third party facilitator can say, what if, what if we just did this, right? So then we hire a consultant because I don't know, I don't know how to put together a planning commission, but there are people that know how to do that. They're bloody good at it. So let's get those guys in. We figure this out. So going forward, I did now see, I just did the thing. I, I said too many councilors, politicians, I told you about all the good stuff we used to do going forward. I would envision this. I would envision uh, and I do, I do this to the extent I can now. I will do it more in the fall. We should be meeting with, like, uh, you know, I should be sitting down with the Reeve. Probably, I just told you, I sit down with my MLA 10 times a year. 
I had to be sitting with the Reeves that many times, if not more a year, just to build those relationships. You know, you talk about, you know, like right now, our, our, our RM, it's harder to say than I thought it would be. Our RM contributes greatly to our community. We partnered on a septage receiving station. They contribute recreation dollars. So when it comes time to talk about a new arena, perhaps, or a new ice surface, it's not just the city of Weyburn talking about that ice surface anymore, right? And the third part of that is, fourth part of that, I suppose, now we're at, is if it's time for an additional ice surface, does the city of Weyburn need to build it? Or can we partner with Yellowgrass, who are, you know, 18 miles down the road, and they got an ice surface that maybe isn't that 120% utilized like ours is? Those are the conversations that we need to start to have outside of City Hall. Okay, so we could probably talk about this subject for about an hour just in itself, but I am cautious of time. And I have okay. the flip side question that I have to ask, because okay. I get accused on the show a lot of only talking about negative things that are going on in the communities. Oh. What is the thing that you boast about when it comes to Weyburn? When you go to SUMA conferences, when you talk to your municipal leader friends from across uh, southwestern, uh, southeastern Saskatchewan, is there something that you boast about when it comes to what's going on in your community? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you in no particular order. There's three or four. I talked to you a minute ago about that youth council that we have. I would, I will, I will get the tattoo if I have to uh, about that. I'm so proud of that. I am very proud of Wayburn's opportunity and what i say is that diversified economy we are home to you know the head offices of the health region uh the regional college both school divisions crescent point saskatchewan operation is here white caps operation so we've got a white collar thing going on we've got some blue collar stuff going on and we are growing right we've 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 surpassed um you know eleven thousand people now We're growing and there's great opportunities here Third piece is what I think Weyburn has done great. And I'm giving you just, you know, high level stuff here because I'm also conscious of time. I could take two and a half hours on all these things. But the third thing is, is that investment in healthy living or in lifestyle that Weyburn has made. We recently built a $25 million um, recreation facility sponsored locally by the credit union. It's called the Weyburn Credit Union Spark Center. You know, indoor walking track, uh, half of a FIFA field on the ground. Um, you know, b batting cages and golf simulators and, you know, mini gyms and great indoor play structure, all that kind of stuff. Also, the Tatagua uh, park system that is in and around Weyburn, uh, that is that is parkland that has been reserved uh, to preserve flora, fauna, but also nine kilometers, I think nearly, I should know that number, of paved walking, uh, biking, biking, cycling tracks, not biking, but cycling tracks throughout that whole parkway. We are conscious that the community of the future will be a community with a focus on quality of life and a good economy. There, so I tried to be quick. <laughs> you did, but I wanna just throw in a quick uh, story for a second here because yeah. it's hopefully got an extra five, 10 minutes here. Oh, I got all kinds of time. Yeah, perfect. Um, so as I said, I was in uh, Weyburn last summer and I was camping. I was doing a big trek through Western Canada and going back to Ontario for a few days to go visit family. And I had to stop in Weyburn, Saskatchewan because A, the campground that I was staying at didn't have uh, adequate uh, facilities to use uh, for uh, like showers and all that. So when I was in Weyburn on a Saturday morning, you have the most friendliest staff that I could ever uh uh, say in the the entire trip that i made uh i went to your local pool which is right beside that beautiful new uh, rec facility that you're talking about and you your staff made me feel welcome like i've never felt welcome before in my life i asked i was very uh, considerate i said i apologize i need to use a shower because uh where i'm just traveling across canada and the per the campground that i didn't have they were very friendly they were very informative they said if you need a uh, good dinner here's a, or a good breakfast here's where you want to go so there's my little plug for the staff at the pool there in Weyburn you have please let pass that along because you you they she left a very indelible mark on me and it makes me want to come back which I will be coming back as I said at the beginning right. and it sort of brings us into the next conversation because I yeah. truly don't feel like I scratched the surface of what truly Weyburn is when I was there so when I come back in about two weeks time 
as I'm coming up to Suma, what are some of the tourist destinations that I should go and see in Weyburn, Saskatchewan while I'm there? Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, it's hard to know what people are into. And, and, and I get this question often from folks coming, family members, friends, or just people you meet when you're out and about in the world. And I think that's important, too, that we go out and see what other communities are doing. So when you have those conversations, and of course, it's kind of a little club, right? The municipal government guys, we all kind of know, you know, uh, anyways, so I would say this to you, Weyburn has a rich history. And I think that that is something that is to be explored. We have got the world's first curling museum here. And if you're into curling, you should see the Turner Curling Museum. There are over, I'm, again, I'm just ballparking numbers, like 18,000 curling pins from around the world. You know, the pins that curlers wear. Some very old, cool stuff. So if, I would say this, if you're into curling and you live in Canada, you need to, and you haven't been to the curling museum, you're probably not as into curling as you think you are. So that's cool. Uh, we've also got the Charlie Wilson sil Silver Collection here. If you're into, again, I'm just talking about artifact kind of stuff. Uh, the largest uh, private silver collection, I think, in North America. Uh, 5,000 pieces, some of them 300 years old. Um, so that's cool. Now, there's other interesting things to see, though. Like So up on the hill, we call it the hill, south end of the city, uh, where the water tower is. I mean, you can see that as a very um, noticeable landmark. In behind that, or to the south of that, kind of down, uh, there's this place called Heritage Village. And that is, and, and the buildings are real. They are not recreated buildings. They've been moved in and they've created sort of what you would call, you know, a uh, typical street circa, you know, 1800 or 1900 in, in Southern Saskatchewan. So, you know, there's a blacksmith shop there. So during Heritage Village days, if you're able to be here for that, the blacksmith is actually there working, forging a horseshoes, things like that. They're making butter and they're making ice cream the old way. It is just, I, you know, uh, my family came to Canada around the turn of the century, the last century. Um, and I think about them folks got off a train in, in Weyburn, Saskatchewan. And they said, somebody said, well, there's your land and there's your tree. Good luck. And they left. And I'm here somehow. I don't know how it worked out. So those things are cool here. I would say, you know, take in our tourist stuff, go for a walk, walk the city, go to the, you know, if you want to go for a walk, Chris, get on the trails by the by the off-leash dog park. The off-leash dog park is fenced, so don't worry about that. But walk in behind there. It is so not the prairies when you get in there, you know, because the river goes through there and it's not just dead grass and and uh, foxtails, right? You, you, you're bound to find, well, depending on the time of the year, maybe find a salamander or God knows what you'll find. It's just beautiful in there and the old bridge um is there uh, also you know up on the hill um uh, the other way if you walk the trails <clears throat> you will come across the original oil well that was built here central del rio i think it's called number one it's still there it doesn't obviously not pumping oil anymore but the pump jack is still there it's just phenomenal to see that history right um and then walk main street stop in the local shops and get you know go to starbucks if you're a starbucks guy Go to the bubble tea place, Miyakaja, go there, get a bubble tea. My first bubble tea was last summer, spring, when those guys opened up. Never had a bubble tea in my life. I'm kind of a bubble tea guy. I didn't think I was going to be a bubble tea guy. Uh, but walk Main Street, stop in the local little shops. So, you know, you can you can go to a, a Walmart or a Winners anywhere in this country. But there's only one place where you can go to the general store, and that's Waver. Right? So that would be my advice to you as a tourist coming here. So when I do come through, hopefully you'll be able to go out and grab a bubble tea with me and we Love will to. walk Main Street together. But I, I, I kind I kind of chuckled there for a few seconds when you said uh, mm -hmm. when your family came to Weyburn at the turn of the century, they got off the train and they said, there's your land and there's your tree. It kind of go it harkens back to the statement that you said earlier on about the doctor. There's your house. Here's your shovel. <laughs> So not much True. has changed, but things have changed. <laughs> You're right. Not much has changed. Yeah. That's a um, great analogy. Yeah. So I've got one last question to ask you, and it's the important yeah. one. And it's the question I ask all my municipal leaders who come on the show, because I think it's a question they know how to answer, but it's always great to hear it from their mouth. What makes the city of Weyburn such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Yeah, it's with what you just said. It's, 
it's a great place to live, work, and raise a family. You know, my wife was born and raised here. I was I was raised in Radville, which is about 30 miles down the road. My wife's born and raised here. She literally, I think, knows every human being in Waver. She when you show up, she probably knows you. Um, but that's just how it is. But I I cherish that, right? Because when somebody's in need, they're they're not in need for long because we know everybody and and somebody will phone and say, you know. Um, we should probably pop over and our police department does wellness checks and all of those things that social network is strong in Waverly. that's important second part is there's jobs here there are so many jobs here uh, there's so much opportunity here we're running a campaign right now called why not Waverly? and if you google it you'll get to the website you know we we got folks moving here from calgary we got folks moving here from down east that are picking up places to live because if one thing covid taught us uh, is that we can Sometimes we don't need to be where we think we need to be to work. Um, so we're doing that and making investments where we can in, in telling people that waiver and story. So, and investment wise, you know, you can, you can still buy an awful nice house for $300,000 in waiver. Right. Uh, and you can't do that in a lot of places. So one of the things that we have, and, and, and I would say this tongue in cheek, uh, Chris, if I could, is sometimes people go, oh, the problem with, you know, it's hard to sometimes not much shopping in Weyburn is because you're so close to Regina. As you, you can be my doorstep to the Regina airport about an hour 20. It's that fast. Like it probably, I don't know where you live in Calgary, Chris, but it probably takes you longer to get to the airport than it takes me to get to the airport. And no, okay, maybe you're close to the airport. I, I could literally see the airport from my back door. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I got a buddy that lives in Seton. In okay. Uh, his journey to the airport, it's not as pleasant as mine, right? So there are there are benefits to, to living close to Regina too. And that sometimes we don't talk about because we don't think we should talk about them. We're an hour from a rider game. We're an hour from the airport. We're an hour from the, uh, what was the guy's name? Morgan Wallen concert, right? We're an hour from all that stuff. And, you know, the next city that's two and a half hours from Regina or Saskatoon, that's just not something that happens. Yeah. Right. So, so that's another unique, because <clears throat> all the other stuff I told you, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of communities can claim that they are the best place to live, work and invest. We've got some stuff that sets us apart. Super diversified economy. Sometimes that proximity to Regina, although it can be a negative thing, well, certainly it can be. It's also a, a positive thing. And we need to embrace that too. Yeah. Jeff, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been an enlightening, almost hour long conversation about municipal politics. Uh, we're about 10 minutes away from that hour mark, but I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. I'm looking forward to being back in Weyburn later on in April, but by the time this airs, we'll have been to Weyburn by the time this airs, but yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to meeting you with you at SUMA again and uh, just continuing this conversation because I feel like we just scratched the surface. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. And I love what you're doing, um, giving, because sometimes the municipal guys don't get that a, a platform, if that's the right word, to sort of say, we're working hard here. And it's not all about, uh, you know, saber rattling governments. Some of us are down here in the trenches, unfortunately, sometimes literally in a trench. But sometimes, you know, we're we're, we're the ones out here where we're, we are trying our very best. And we make mistakes from time to time. But rest assured that we're doing what we think is the very best thing that we can do for for you as an, as our friends and neighbors so i appreciate what you're doing and sometimes maybe you know we need to also celebrate the fact that people are trying to tell our story so thank you much appreciated jeff now if today's episode sparked your interest hit that subscribe button now stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches local government at work now we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well informed as well as engaged but your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just 
keep talking.